our world is transforming. The need to anticipate and create what's next from data is greater than ever before. So, how do we connect the dots? Cutting edge data science is the engine driving growth, efficiency, and competitive advantage for today's most successful organizations. We talk about reimagining what's possible for our clients. And I mean, I think there's no greater place that we can do that than with data science. Unlock innovation. We are leveraging data science to improve the probability that a therapy or an innovation actually becomes a transformational medicine for patients. Enable breakthrough customer experiences. Predict and create the future. Data science is understanding, opportunity, foresight, transformation, acceleration. Data science drives new breakthroughs and innovations. How will you break through? Hello everyone and welcome. My name is Grant Ho and I'm the Chief Marketing Officer at Domino Data Lab. I'm thrilled you're here with us for this very special event. To get us started, we all know the path from an innovative idea to a major breakthrough powered by data science is long. It's challenging and it's only getting more complex. That's what we're here to explore today. What ingredients do you need to drive impact at scale with data science and models? What is that recipe for breakthrough innovations using machine learning? That theme was front and center at last month's Rev3 Enterprise MLOps Conference in New York City, where data science leaders worldwide gathered to learn, reconnect, and get inspired. Now, for anyone who couldn't attend in person, you missed a fantastic couple of days of learning, but today is your lucky day. Today, we're bringing you some of the key content from Rev3, all around how you as innovators in data science and technology can drive those breakthroughs that truly move the needle. We have three fantastic speakers on deck. First up, Domino's CEO and co-founder, Nick Elprin. He'll share some key insights on how enterprises can become more model-driven, plus some exciting new capabilities in the Domino platform. Then, we'll introduce two inspiring leaders to the stage, Jim Swanson, Enterprise CIO at Johnson & Johnson, and Linda Avery, Chief Data and Analytics Officer at Verizon. They'll each share their own enterprise data science journeys and the ingredients that have made both J&J &J and Verizon market leaders. With that, let's get started. This morning, I want to talk about unleashing data science innovation. And to get us started with that, I am going to talk about mold. This is, uh, this is penicillium, and it led to one of the most important breakthrough innovations of the 20th century, penicillin. Now, the popular story of penicillin, which I'm sure a lot of you know, is in 1928, Scottish scientist Alexander Fleming accidentally left a Petri dish with some bacteria in it by a window before he went out of town. When he came back, he saw there was mold growing in the dish, and he was about to go throw it out, but he looked at it under a microscope, and lo and behold, the mold was breaking down the bacteria's walls, and it was, it was killing the bacteria. Yada, yada, yada. Decades later, Fleming's got a Nobel Prize, and he's credited with saving hundreds of millions of lives. And this story reflects a popular view of innovation, namely that it happens when the lone genius has the flash of insight, like, uh, like Newton conceiving of gravity when the apple falls on his head. But the reality of what it takes to turn insight into impact is much messier and more complicated. So let me share a slightly more complete version of the penicillin story. Uh, first of all, Fleming, this is Fleming, uh, he didn't realize the medical implications of his discovery. In fact, he never tested his mold outside of a Petri dish. It took an entire decade later for two Oxford scientists to see the potential of his work and to advance it for medical purposes. That was um, Howard Florey and Ernst Chain. And these guys spent three years experimenting with ways to concentrate and purify mold to make it suitable as medicine. And as an aside, the next time you hear a data scientist complain about cleaning data, you should remind them some scientists spend years of their lives working with mold juice. So anyway, by 1941, these guys were ready to test their medicine on human subjects. 
and they gave, uh, one of their first subjects, they gave it to a policeman who had become desperately and pathetically ill. And it was, I mean, it was miraculous. Almost in front of their very eyes, he began to recover. Until they ran out of penicillin, at which point his recovery reversed course, and he quickly died. Now, World War II was going on by this point, and that was creating urgent demand for medicine like this. So Flory and Chain connected with the US Department of Agriculture lab in Illinois. And there they got access to military funding, to industrial grade production equipment, and to a much bigger team. And they experimented with everything from different source strains for the mold they used to different ways of feeding it. And they figured out how to scale production. And by the time Allied troops landed at Normandy in June of 1944, they were carrying penicillin with them along with their weapons. So if anyone in the audience today has an ancestor who fought in World War II, there's a decent chance you might not be here without the work that these folks did. So what does all this have to do with data science? Realizing the potential of data science innovation requires turning insight into impact. And unfortunately, a lot of companies today, or I should say, um, the question we should all be asking ourselves as data science leaders is, is our work more like the mold in the Petri dish, or is it more like saving lives on the battlefield? And unfortunately, a lot of companies today still seem to view data science as like the lone genius flash of insight. What I mean is they seem to think that you sort of sprinkle some AI pixie dust or some auto ML on your data and the insights pop out. But the companies that are winning with data science are doing the hard, disciplined work to operationalize it at scale. These are model-driven businesses. They go beyond being merely data-driven. They use data science to automate decision-making, automate business processes, automate product behaviors. They weave data science and models into the fabric of their business. And by doing so, they unlock new revenue streams, they create major new efficiencies, and they create superior customer experiences. They can do that because compared to human decision-making, models act much faster, they are less biased, and they learn and evolve, so they continuously compound incremental improvement. They give company, they give, they, models give companies superpowers uh, to outcompete and out-innovate their rivals. And COVID was like a crucible that accelerated this trend. We saw companies not merely survive, but thrive by investing in data science in the face of uncertainty. By the end of last year, Johnson & Johnson was applying for more AI-related patents than any other pharma company. They built deep learning models to help diagnose prostate cancer. They built other models to manage their supply chains, which were critical as they scaled drug production. These models saved lives. John Deere released new sprayers that use computer vision to precisely identify and target weeds when they sprayed herbicides. These models helped to feed the world and protect the planet. And Top Denmark, which is the second largest insurance company in Denmark, has automated core business processes. In a majority of cases now, their customers can get instant automatic decisions on policies and claims. These models are helping to create loyal customers and beat competitors. At Domino, we have never been more proud to be helping model-driven businesses unleash data science to address some of the world's biggest challenges. And we made a short video to show you a couple of these stories. Take a look. The mission and the purpose of data science at J&J is one and the same with the overarching mission and credo of J&J, which is to improve the trajectory of human health. We use data science, everything from AI machine learning to real world evidence to digital health to improve the medicines and therapies that we're making for patients. You know, imagine if you're a patient that unfortunately has been diagnosed with cancer. And now there are certain mutations where there's a treatment that can improve the outcome for that for you. But increasingly, it's harder to find those patients because these mutations are new and therefore are not sequenced on a regular basis. But remember, every single patient gets a biopsy. So what we have done using data science is digitize those pathology, those biopsy slides, and then actually use AI machine learning to be able to predict what mutation a patient might have just from those images. You can find patients who may otherwise have been undiagnosed 
or you can find them earlier. The Ford has a, a proud history and a great legacy and really about putting the world on wheels and, and providing transportation and mobility. Machine learning is critical to many things that we do today. Uh, it's important in our products, some of the features uh, and, and just making our products smarter and more capable. It's also critical in, in many of the ways that we operate in our manufacturing systems, in uh, our engineering and everything that we do. Of course, with our customers' consent, we're able to use crowdsourced information about how vehicles are operating uh, and then redistribute that information to the vehicles so they have a much more accurate uh, estimation of their range, as one example. New York Life is uh, a, a very old and very large life insurance company in the United States. We're over 175 years old. We have a multitude of projects and doing things like predicting mortality, doing things like predicting success of agents. We also have lots of marketing projects that predict things like retention and cross sale and lifetime value. So all of those are deeply embedded in those business processes and creating value every day for the company. And the platform that we have where we're building models and we partner with Domino on that really has been one of the underpinnings of being able to scale. When I say go from 10 to 100, now actually probably 150 plus projects, you can't do that unless you have a standardized way of having all the data, models, applications in one place. Domino powers data science at Ford Motor Company. The data science teams using Domino now have faster access to many of the tools they need. Uh, what data sets they're using helps uh, avoid or eliminate redundant work and, in general, work faster. Domino has allowed our data scientists to collaborate much more efficiently. Domino allows us to have all of our models on a single platform. Um, and then, you know, have that platform communicate via an API to any production system in the company. So that's been a, a big game changer for us uh, in, the, in the drive to uh, deploy everything and deploy everything relatively fast. These companies are doing the hard, disciplined work to operationalize data science at scale. They're not merely dabbling. And that brings me to the first big thing I want to make sure everyone takes away from my talk this morning. Playtime is over for data science. If you can't repeatedly turn data science into business impact, if you can't describe that impact, if your work is still relegated to an AI innovation lab, then you are already behind, whether you realize it or not. So what are these companies doing? What are the sort of secrets to model-driven businesses being successful? Well, the great thing about Rev is you're going to hear from a lot of them directly. And so a lot of them are speaking, grab them in the hallways, pick their brain. I want to share some of the recurring patterns that I've seen from working with the most effective, successful data science organizations over years. And there are three core ingredients, core building blocks that I have just seen over and over and over again. They empower expert data scientists to build an experiment. They make it easy to productionize data science work and they forge deep cross-functional relationships with the business and with IT. Let me tell you a little more about each of these. First of all, they hire professional data scientists, the best ones they can find, and then they equip them with all the resources they need to experiment and build. That means the compute resources, the data, the software tools they need, whatever, you know, whatever, whatever it is. The way they think about this is they, they try to minimize the time from when a data scientist has an idea for something they want to try and when they can actually try it. And look, I should say, there's a place for folks with less advanced skill sets, you know, the sort of the analysts or the, the, drag, the drag and drop folks, but no company is making deep, meaningful progress in this domain without a core of expert data scientists. Then they make it easy to get work, data science work productionized. And, and again, I should say, this doesn't necessarily mean that everything has to become a you know, web scale, real time API. But my point is that simply prototyping an idea doesn't create impact. Companies have to find ways to get data science work 
integrated into the business processes and the systems that ultimately affect tangible decisions and outcomes. And finally, data science teams work hand in glove with the business and with IT. They align priorities, they share goals, they collaborate closely at all levels of the organization. And the partnership with IT is becoming especially important as advanced infrastructure and technology becomes more critical to enabling data science, to build, data science teams to build an experiment. And this is the second big thing I wanna make sure everybody takes away from my talk this morning, these three core ingredients for data science innovation and impact. Empowering experts to build, creating paths to production, and deep cross-functional collaboration, especially with IT. By the way, there are echoes of these themes in that penicillin story I shared, and I bet we're gonna hear some more from Dr. Dowden this afternoon. Now, unfortunately, here's the wrinkle. The more success that a company has with data science, the more they can start to face back pressures that threaten uh, or make it harder to sustain these core ingredients. Let me give you a couple examples of what I mean. First, the more that a company identifies more use cases and applications for data science, the more that can create challenges for data scientists to be adequately empowered with all the resources they need to meet the demands of the business. To give you an example, one of our customers had some early success with a, um, a deep learning natural language processing model, and the business wanted them to scale that same technique to sort of apply it in other places. But the data scientists quickly became hamstrung on limited access to GPUs, and so they couldn't meet the demands and expectations that the business was hoping for. In a similar vein, the more the data science touches more parts of a business, the more it can become challenging to get work productionized, because you're increasingly having to bump into more diverse and more idiosyncratic production systems. Uh, to give you another example, one of our customers had a model that was having success. They wanted to scale it or deploy it into international markets, but that work quickly got gummed up because they found out every different international market had its own separate tech stack and idiosyncratic data security requirements. And finally, as data science touches more mission-critical data and business processes, that can heighten tensions with IT. Because IT, understandably, cares about things like governance and security, and then data science comes along and they want more and more compute resources and they want more and more software tools, and then IT gets concerned about cost management and operational burden and complexity. And so data science and IT can have goals that become increasingly at odds. These dynamics create real challenges for companies as they scale data science. They make it harder to empower experts to build, they make it harder to productionize work, and they make it harder for IT and data science to collaborate. It's almost as though data science gets crushed under the weight of its early success. So what's the solution? What are companies supposed to do? Well, obviously, leadership and culture and organizational structures have a massive, massive role to play in unleashing data science innovation and impact. And you're gonna hear a lot about that over the next two days, as we already heard some from, uh, from Mike. At Domino, we think about the role that technology can play in unleashing data science innovation. And that's what I wanna wrap up with this morning. When I look at the technology landscape today around data science, I see two very different approaches. And I think as an industry, we're at a bit of a crossroads. On the one hand, there are walled gardens. They promise the simplicity of a one-stop shop. And this can appeal to IT because less choice makes things easier to manage uh, and easier to govern. And data scientists can build and productionize work as long as they kind of stay within the confines of the walled garden. But these walls create real limits and constraints. And data scientists are out of luck if they want to venture outside of the preferred set of algorithms or compute frameworks or infrastructure. And then there's the second approach, and this is the third thing I want to make sure everybody takes away from my talk this morning. We believe the future of data science is open and flexible because the ecosystem is evolving so quickly, and I think we're still in fairly early days of really refining and honing our techniques and our methods and our tools. So over the coming years to beat, beat rivals and to win the war for top talent, companies are gonna have to be able to access the latest and greatest compute frameworks, software tools, packages, algorithms, data sets, data sources, you name it, whatever those resources might be. This is our vision for Domino. 
It's a platform that makes it easy for data scientists to build and productionize work with the flexibility and choice that they want, while giving IT the control and the security and the governance that they need. Rather than a walled garden, we picture a network of pathways uh, integrated into the ecosystem and connected safely and securely. Now today, we've got about a dozen new capabilities to show you in the platform that further this vision. And to show you more and tell you some more, uh, please welcome our chief data scientist, Josh Paduska. Good morning. It's great to be with you today. At Domino, our North Star is to speed up the development and productionization of data science work. And we believe this is best accomplished by giving data scientists freedom while giving IT the security and control they need. Today, we're going to show several new features to unlock faster development and easier productionization. But before I get into that, I want to double click on the ecosystem and on IT's needs. First, when it comes to the ecosystem, we have been investing in integrations with two key players in the data science landscape, NVIDIA and Snowflake. Now, obviously, data and compute are both critical to data science. And you can't talk about data without talking about Snowflake. And you can't talk about compute without talking about NVIDIA. So what you're going to see in a minute is how we are making it much easier to leverage NVIDIA and Snowflake across the data science lifecycle, from experimentation to production. Second, let's talk about IT. To build product that IT loves, you have to understand what IT cares about. Now, while data science cares about compute, data, and software, IT needs to reduce spend and operational complexity to ensure security and to increase consistency and standardization. I want you to keep these in mind as you watch the demos you're about to see. As we've been building new capabilities to unleash data science, we've kept these IT concerns front and center. The result is software that both IT and data science love. OK, now for the fun part. First, we have a set of new capabilities that make it easier for data scientists to build and experiment by putting more compute data and software at their fingertips. Let's take a look. I'm going to show you how Domino makes it easy for data scientists to experiment and build, while also keeping IT happy by reducing costs, securing data, and standardizing software tools. As an example, I'm a data scientist at a large health sciences company and need to develop a model for processing brain scans. I'll be working with hundreds of gigs of data and want to be able to train efficiently so I can try multiple experiments without having to wait days for the results. I want to use the latest open source packages for image processing, but I don't want to deal with installation, configuration, and GPU driver setup. Domino lets me create new compute environments with one click, meaning that I have the flexibility to work in a software environment that's already been properly set up and configured, saving tons of manual DevOps work. And we recently introduced a major enhancement to Domino compute environments. Data scientists can now create these environments directly from external pre-existing Docker images without the need for any additional configuration. This is fantastic for data scientists, and also for IT, since it means they can now allow data scientists to use images from their internal secured image repositories to ensure proper compliance and validation is in place. We've also designed this to work seamlessly with NVIDIA NGC containers, a repository of GPU-optimized AI images. Let's say I want to use the latest TensorFlow image with everything pre-configured to work with my NVIDIA GPUs. I can just input the URI to the relevant NGC container, and Domino is ready to go. This one-click access to pre-configured external images is going to save data scientists tons of time. Now, I'll move into my project, which is where I organize and track my work, experiment, and deploy models. Domino has always supported connections to diverse data locations, and has now made it even easier with the introduction of Domino data sources which eliminate the need to install specific drivers or libraries. We have numerous built-in data sources. In this case, I'm going to select Snowflake and add details about the database. I'll then add credentials for my individual account, but my admin can also add service accounts and make those available to me as well. These credentials are kept in Domino's encrypted secret store, backed by HashiCorp Vault. 
Our newest release brings more advanced authentication to data sources. Domino can now use external identity systems, removing the need for long-lived credentials and adding another layer of security by centralizing access management. Now that I have my data set up and my environment created, I'm ready to begin training my model. I'll be using Domino's interactive durable workspaces, which give me flexible access to the hardware and tools that I need. In this case, I'm using the NGC container-based environment I created earlier and Jupyter Lab, though I could easily use any other IDE I prefer. A great new feature that Domino has recently introduced is intelligent volume provisioning, which will analyze my project and recommend the best volume size. This helps reduce cloud spend and operational burden. Next, I'll attach a distributed compute cluster. Domino already had Spark, Ray, and Dask on-demand clusters available, giving data scientists easy access to the power of distributed compute with the click of a button, without the need for IT to manage the cluster or pay for it to stay up when not in use. Today, we're announcing the addition of on-demand MPI clusters, giving data scientists the power to run multi-GPU, multi-node training, with unrivaled efficiency and fine-grained control, providing even more flexibility for high-performance computing. I'm going to use a cluster of 16 GPU nodes, but can scale this up or down as I experiment. Domino addresses IT concerns around cost by giving admins the ability to set controls for hardware usage, including the choice of how many machines each data scientist can use concurrently, customized notifications about running time, and the automatic shutdown of machines. Now that I'm in my workspace, I'll start by accessing my data. Domino's Data Sources feature has an associated library that makes it easy to access both tabular and file-based data, and even provides a code snippet that I can copy and paste to get started. As I experiment, I can submit training jobs to the MPI cluster with minimal setup, since Domino has created all of the necessary environment variables I need to easily connect, and has copied my files over to each of the nodes. Without Domino, I would have had to manually deal with networking and MPI host files, copy data to the cluster nodes, and install necessary packages on the cluster machines. In this example, training that would have taken several hours on a single node is finished in minutes. Domino is the only platform that empowers data scientists like this by putting the software, data, and compute they want right at their fingertips in a familiar interface. If I pause my durable workspace, Domino preserves my work and spins down my compute resources to save costs. If I resume later, it will reinstate all my work with the click of a button. And my IT team is thrilled because Domino reduces operational burden and cloud spend while keeping everything secured and managed. Thank you, Andrea. With easier access to compute data and software, access that's also safe and secure, data scientists will unlock more breakthrough innovation. But all those breakthroughs will only be valuable if they can be operationalized, meaning if they can be integrated into production systems that drive action and decisions in the business. We're making this easier, too, with new ways to productionize data science work. Let's see how in the second video. I'm going to show you how Domino makes it faster and easier than ever before to turn data science innovation into business impact. As Nick said, we believe model-driven businesses will need to integrate models into a variety of different business processes. Our vision is for Domino to be a single pane of glass to productionize data science work. In fact, Domino already lets data scientists deploy work in a variety of ways. As APIs hosted in Domino or in AWS SageMaker, as interactive apps, or as batch scheduled jobs. Today, we're introducing three new ways to deploy data science work to address emerging use cases. Hosting deep learning models with GPU-backed APIs, deploying models to the edge with NVIDIA fleet command, and in database batch scoring using Snowflake. Let's look at each of these in turn. First, we're adding support for GPUs in our model inference REST APIs. This is important as more companies are beginning to operationalize models that use unstructured data like text and images and benefit from the performance of GPUs. Domino enables data scientists to deploy models with GPUs in just a few clicks. Let's say I want to publish a model I built with TensorFlow using a compatible Docker image and extended with external repos like NGC. 
I know my inference is going to be compute intensive, so I need to deploy the model with GPUs instead of CPUs. In just a few simple clicks, I can select the GPU configuration suited for my model. And to scale my endpoint, I can deploy multiple instances, each with their own powerful GPU. That's it. Now it's easier than ever for data scientists to deploy models for NLP or image processing use cases with the inference power of GPUs at their fingertips. Next, let's look at another increasingly important way to productionize data science work, scaling AI applications at the edge. This is becoming critical for use cases such as anomaly detection at cell phone towers and quality control in manufacturing. Domino's new integration with NVIDIA Fleet Command makes it easy to deploy models to the edge. In this example, I've built a model in Domino to evaluate the remaining useful life for a turbine valve and want to deploy it to an edge application. With a simple API invocation, Domino packages the image and associated artifacts and registers this containerized model with Fleet Command. Note that I can also use this API in my CI-CD workflows to automate model deployment to the edge. Now, I can visit the Fleet Command console to configure the Edge AI application to invoke my Turbine Valve Health model. With Domino's model export catalog, I now get a unified view of all exported models and their performance, so I can track and manage my production assets from a single pane of glass. By simplifying this process down to a few steps, Domino has made it really simple for data scientists and their IT counterparts to operationalize a model at the edge. Finally, let's look at end database coding in Snowflake with integrated model monitoring. Snowflake is now the canonical data store for many companies. Moving large volumes of data to the model for inference can be costly and involve security concerns. Companies are now shifting to an approach where the model comes to the data. Today, we're announcing Domino's integration with Snowflake Snowpark that makes it easy to deploy models for end database coding at scale. Let's see how this works. In this example, I have built a customer churn prediction model in Domino and have written my inference function that I intend to invoke from Snowflake. With just a few simple steps, Domino lets me select the function, specify the necessary connection details, and takes care of registering my model and code with Snowflake. I can now hop over to the Snowflake console and with a simple query, execute in database scoring, invoking the churn prediction model I just exported. It's that easy. Fast forward, the deployed model in Snowflake has been used for making batch predictions and I've received a data drift notification. In this case, I can see that the two features that have drifted have untrained classes, and this gives me enough information to remediate the drift. Domino has made it easy to productionize my data science work across a variety of destinations and use cases, and all within a single pane of glass that offers simplicity for data scientists and governance for IT. Thank you, Vinay. Domino gives data scientists unprecedented flexibility to experiment and productionize their work while giving IT the security and control they need. We can't wait to see what new innovations this unlocks in the next generation of model-driven businesses. Nick, back to you. All right, we have, uh, we have one more announcement today, and I am, I'm so excited about this. It's gonna be a game changer. I cannot wait to tell you all and show you all about it. To set the stage, I wanna highlight some of the tensions that we hear when we talk to our customers. On the one hand, everybody wants more compute for more data science workloads. This is being driven by increasing demand and success for uh, deep learning use cases and unstructured data, uh, by growing data volumes just in general, and by more computationally intensive algorithms. But on the other hand, compute is really expensive, especially those sweet, sweet GPUs. Uh, on the one hand, everybody wants to apply data science to more critical, core, and secure data sets. But on the other hand, the more secure a data set is, the more it's harder to access, the more it comes with restrictions. Uh, we talked earlier about how, in some cases, data can't leave a certain region because of data locality restrictions. And finally, there's cloud. Uh, on the one hand, everybody's moving to the cloud, or everybody's in the cloud already. 
But on the other hand, being in the cloud isn't really a binary state, it's more of a spectrum. Uh, even companies that are already in the cloud have data that's still on premise and will be for some time. And eventually everybody wants to be in multiple clouds anyway. When we talk to data science leaders and IT leaders about what they really, really want, what we hear is basically some version of, I want the best of both worlds. Uh, meaning they want to be able to run some compute or a lot of compute in the cloud, but they want to have the flexibility to run workloads on premise when it's more cost effective or more convenient, like GPU clusters. Or they want the security of segmented data infrastructure, but with the convenience of a single way to access the data and without the complexity of different tech stacks. Or they want to be able to move to the cloud, but they want to be able to do it incrementally and without the risk of lock-in. Today, we're announcing a new hybrid architecture to address these challenges. It is going to be a single control point that will let companies run data science workloads across different compute clusters, whether those are in different regions or on-premise or even across different clouds. Uh, we're really excited about this because it's going to unlock more experimentation and make it easier for data scientists to build and productionize work while giving IT the help they need to control costs and security and governance. It is going to be a major, major step change for data science infrastructure. Uh, let's take a look. Thanks, Nick. We set out to create an intuitive, seamless, and almost a magical experience for data scientists that puts infrastructure at their fingertips from one central interface. It's quite an engineering challenge to build something simple and intuitive that's also enterprise grade for the hybrid world. Our engineering team is solving for some unique challenges that come along with building a hybrid cloud architecture. Our architecture today is built to handle unpredictable nature of hybrid cloud connectivity, which can be intermittent and high latency. With the help of message brokers and custom Kubernetes operators, we can now help data scientists focus on their data science work during these interruptions. We're building our architecture by keeping the stringent security needs of enterprise IT in mind. By supporting encryption at rest, secure TLS connections, and outbound only connections from our customers' infrastructure. While at the same time, we want to hide all of this complexity from the data scientists and build a user experience that's simple and familiar to our Domino customers. We are so proud of the work we've done so far and really thrilled about the delightful experience we're building for you all. Now let's walk through a real world example so you can see what it looks and feels like. Imagine I'm working at a multinational bank with infrastructure that's spanning across multiple regions, multiple public clouds, and on-premise resources. Some of my data is locked into certain regions because of the GDPR requirements. Let's say I'm building fraud models that use images representing document scans. I want to begin by quickly prototyping a model by working on a small sample data set. So I decide to launch a workspace and I notice a few different options for hardware tiers that are backed by different infrastructure providers. First thing to note is that my IT organization is going to love this because I have an abstraction layer in front of different cloud platforms, reducing my lock-in risks and making it easier to implement a multi-cloud strategy going forward. All right, so I want to choose the one that's smallest and that can be quickly spun up. So let's go with CPU small in AWS. As you can see, Domino is spinning up a new workspace for me in AWS, and I continue to prototype my model there. Fast forward, I'm quite happy with where I am with the prototype, and now want to train the model on a full-size data set that's approximately 200 terabyte. I decide to launch a Domino job to train the model. As the data set is huge, I know I'm going to need GPUs to ensure good performance. Looking at the options, I think I'm going to choose my on-prem NVIDIA GPU cluster. I am happy because I have one-click access to powerful GPUs, which are normally complex to access, and my IT team is happy because for a training job of this size, 
I would be paying a fortune looking at the AWS GPU prices and a zero marginal cost for my on-prem cluster. Just to recap, so far I've done prototyping in AWS and my training on an on-premise NVIDIA GPU cluster. And I'm happy with my results, but there's actually one more wrinkle I have to deal with. Earlier, I said that the 200 terabyte data set was the full data set. Well, that wasn't quite true. See, I need different versions of this model in different countries because of the differences in document format and languages in different regions. Several of those regions have strict data privacy regulations that restrict data from leaving the region at all. So to train some country-specific models, I actually need to use country-specific data. Now imagine doing this without Domino. You would have to locate the data, find out the cloud provider that's available in that region, file a ticket with IT to get access to some infrastructure that's appropriate, then upload that data. All of this before you even get to training the model. Now imagine doing this multiple times for other countries and the amount of precious time you would waste. With Domino, I can do this in minutes. I can trigger multiple jobs by choosing different compute options that IT has already provisioned for me. And notice that based on the infrastructure that I chose earlier, Domino automatically identified the right data sets that are accessible from that region. That is neat and is going to save me a ton of time. By the way, as a data science leader, I can track all of these jobs running across different regions under a single Domino interface, making Domino my single system of record for all of the data science work, no matter where it happens. Now that I've trained my models, I want to deploy them in different EU regions. Vinay already walked you all through the deployment workflow. And with Domino Nexus, now I can choose different compute environments and deploy my models across different regions, clouds, and on-premise clusters. Now think about the end-to-end -end workflow. This would have been practically impossible without Domino, or it would have taken weeks worth of work to move the data around and manage different environments. Domino made it seamless and simple, all while massively reducing our cloud compute bill keeping our data secure, and enabling IT to incrementally pursue a cloud migration strategy. Back to you, Nick. What would you all think? Yeah, that's pretty cool, right? Um, OK, uh, we're going to be shipping Nexus later this year. We're starting our preview program. If you want to be a part of this, we'd, we'd really love your feedback. Uh, you can shoot us an email at nexus at dominodatalab.com or come see us at our booth uh, after the talks here. And um, with that, I'll just say thank you and enjoy the next two days at Rev. Thanks. Now, to build on the themes Nick just covered, I'm excited to introduce our next guest who will share Verizon's transformational journey with data, AI, and models. That journey has produced some incredible results, including billions of dollars of incremental value every year through the power of data science. Our next speaker served in top data leadership roles at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York and Goldman Sachs. And she's received an impressive list of industry honors, including being named CDO of the Year by the CDO Club. In a fireside chat with Domino's co-founder, Matthew Grenade, here's Verizon's Chief Data and Analytics Officer, Linda Avery. Linda, thank you so much for being here with us today. I'm very excited to talk to you about um, what all the things you're doing at Verizon. So to kick us off, you know, I know business impact is really important to you, and it's something that's uh, something every time I talk to you, it, it's something we talk about. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you think about the business impact of data science at Verizon? Ab and a little bit why it's so important to you. Absolutely. And, and first of all, I just have to say I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for inviting me. And to be here with a live audience is a thrill. Isn't it? It's uh, so it different is. than <laughs> done is. for the last couple of years. It is. And um, so on the topic of um, you know, business value and, and at, at Verizon, it's, it was very interesting to arrive at Verizon because it is just such a broad canvas. 
If you think about you know, the businesses that we're in, if you think about you know, building the network, network performance, customer service, retail stores, I mean, it is just a huge enterprise. And one of the things that we had to do was really develop a discipline. Um, so that we were not going to be in a position of um, really positioning ourselves too thin across the board. So at the heart of you know, the way that we approach data science at Verizon is what we call the path to value. And it was really this discipline that allowed us to um, arrive at an almost $2 billion worth of value in our first year of operation. So let me talk a little bit about what the path to value is. Um, it is a discipline where we really don't start moving towards an opportunity until we have an evaluation from the business in terms of the size of that opportunity. So we know at that point we have the buy-in of the business, which is so instrumental when you're trying to stand up a new function, um, such as, as data science. And with that buy-in, it was with the transformation offices, it was with finance, it was the businesses. We then would go through an evaluation of what data assets would be required to bring this opportunity to life, and what models would be required, and what was the level of effort that was, was, was required. And so we looked at this whole canvas here from a very architectural perspective in terms of what data assets could basically bring to life the most valuable opportunities and what model disciplines could bring to life the most valuable opportunities. And that's really how we arrived at our book of work. And um, you know, what was very interesting was it was a very, again, very diverse book of work that first year, 53 different engagements, um, you know, ranging from customer service to um, how we were planning out the 5G network. Mm. So one of the things kind of embedded in this idea of a business value is, or the ability to, I guess, demonstrate uh, business value is measurement. Um, and I mean, Grant referenced the $2 billion number. You know, in, in my experience, uh, th those numbers fly around a lot of times and people kind of roll their eyes and, um, <laughs> you know, there's a lot of skepticism. So how did you think about that problem and how did you, you know, how did you get credibility to those numbers? Well, you know, I think the most important factor there is that these are not our numbers. And so the numbers that we, we cite here are the numbers that were cited by the transformation offices and that were signed off by the chief financial offices of each of the businesses. So we actually had nothing to do with the numbers. Mm. Um, and it was them that basically gave us the green light to start moving towards you know, these different opportunities. I think that was really key, that you needed that objectivity. I mean, sure, I could make up any number, right. um, but that was not how we did it. It really had to come from the T transformation offices and then also the finance people. So inside Verizon, like the number, like the two billion number or a project by project number, yeah. there's broad agreement on that. Like, there's, is, is, is it fair to say there's consensus? There is, there is consensus. On the other hand, you know, there's always this challenge of like, why aren't we seeing this in the bottom line? Um, and nobody wants to hear, well, you may not be seeing it because you know, things would have been much you know, worse if we weren't here to help you in some ways. So these things you know, often result in, um, in dollars that get spent in other ways. Mm -hmm. um, so the optimization and also the revenue um, is, is something that I think you know, is obviously a big focus for everybody today as we're facing a lot of um, economic headwinds. Um, so, I mean, I think it's always this challenge of, you know, you deliver results and businesses don't want to hear, well, without us, it could have been much worse, right? right. right? <laughs> um, let, let's back up just a little bit. I mean, what is the story of data science at Verizon and, and how did that come about and, and how, did, how did you get involved in it? Well, I am their first chief data and analytics officer. This is my second gig as the first. Mm -hmm. Um, I arrived at Verizon about two and a half years ago, and um, I started as a team of one. Um, I did not even have an executive assistant, and I found myself in an industry I had never worked in before, so it was a little bit daunting. Um, and I would also have to say that, you know, standing up a new organization in the throes of a pandemic um, is not for the faint of heart. Um, it, needless to say, HR was a little bit distracted with everything else that was going on. Um, but you know, we, I began by you know, a very um, intensive listening tour, of course, and then out of that came an organizational 
design that I think was really instrumental in why we've been successful. So let me talk a little bit about that. Let's do that, yeah. Um, so if you, if you look at how our AI and data organization is structured, um, we really operate with, with two different cadences. One is very business-facing. And so what I did is I hired people of the business who had a lot of credibility, um, were really trusted individuals, knew the business, let's say knew marketing inside and out, and I brought them in in leadership capacities, even if they didn't have a data science background um, per se. Mm. And so it was through these leaders that I was able to um, arrive at an organization that could identify opportunities and could gain the trust. Within those groups, we call them the enablement teams, we also had a cadre of data scientists, um, business translators, some data engineers that could actually spin up you know, experiments, proof of concepts, et cetera, rapidly so that we could identify whether the value that we expected was even feasible. And so the, the goal here was to really give the businesses some immediate gratification without all the overhead of, of industrializing. So this is kind of a very different cadence than what you normally see with application development, um, where you design everything. Um, as, as, as people know, the, you know, it, the data science needs to be very ex experimental, very iterative, and you know, it's very important that the businesses are very engaged in that iteration. So those were the, that, that was the front-facing part of this, the team. And then behind this, we stood up an organization that you know, is around industrialization, which is data governance, data architecture, data engineering, platform engineering, ML operations. And of course, we also stood up an AI center where we began to, and we've made some great progress here, stand up different disciplines around optimization, forecasting, personalization, um, cognitive AI plays heavily. Mm. Um, and so they're brought to bear um, as well within the the pods that we create around each of the, the, the opportunities we have. But this, this double cadence has been incredibly successful for us. And how big is the organization today? Um, it's 1,000 people. Wow. We have 1,000, and um, it was, you know, that was part of the journey. I certainly didn't hire all 1,000 of these people, so um, a number of folks came in from the um, IT organization. It was very interesting for me to hear you know, Nick talking about the importance of that partnership, and that is absolutely the case. Right. I think what's also true, though, is um, there is a differently a cultural difference um, that you want to see within a data science organization. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, we did a lot of work in terms of the, the culture of the new organization that we were standing up. You mentioned, uh, you mentioned IT earlier, um, as did Nick. Um, I'm curious, what is your relationship like with IT, and um, and 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 what do you how what do you want it to be like, and how how do you engineer that, just like you engineer kind of other pieces of the organization? I think you know if I were to describe it, it is a highly symbiotic relationship. I mean, insights of any magnitude or significance can't be delivered without technology, um, and so you know we may have the insights in our organization, but technology is the envelope. Ultimately, but if I were to look at the relationship, it, it's a relationship that's still in progress because I think there's still um, understanding to be gained around what it means to actually sustain models. Mm -hmm. So it, we really need to move away from this notion of, you know, looking at something as a project that has a completion date to a recognition that models are in essence evergreen. What you're building out is an ecosystem that has to be, on an ongoing basis, monitored, but also optimized. Um, that you're going to be looking for new data sets, or there are going to be shifts in the data, so models have to be retrained. So this notion of something just being done is, 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 is just not how it works. And so that's, I think, where we're getting um, traction in the understanding. But I think that's been the hardest thing for IT to understand about how data science happens. Mm. And it's also been, you know, I think, a challenge for the business people to understand that these are just not simple projects. I mean, some of them are. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes you spin up a model, you answer a question, and then you're done. Right. But a lot of these things are going to be living. I think about, you know, scheduling customer service agents. Um, well, you know, when there's a new promotion that's happening, 
Um, we need to be able to expect the, the volumes that are going to hit those people. Right. Um, new kind of promotion, new kind of volume. Right. And so there's this constant monitoring. I think that, you know, when I think of um, the amount of focus that has to go into change management, it's not just with IT. I think business people, um, you, you, you establish their trust in, in, in the accuracy of what you can provide them. That's fantastic. And now they think that you've provided them with a magical black box. And they don't have to tell the black box anything because the black box is somehow omniscient. Um, so it's like, OK, there's an org change. Somehow this black box is going to know that. Um, so to really you know, help them understand that this is intended to assist them, and by the same token, they have to assist the models, right. that this, again, is a symbiotic relationship is one of the big change management shifts that needs to happen. Right. And I guess that comes back to the um, kind of the interface you've built between your organization and the business. What kind of people, I mean, so this is one of the themes that I find um, folks want to talk about a lot is how does, how does the data science organization interface with the business? What kind of people do you find work best in those sorts of interface roles? Uh, who, do, who do you like to hire for that? I like to hire people who are passionate about the business that are highly commercial. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're, we at, at Verizon um, you know, are not at the point where we have the luxury to really be doing a lot of, of, of research in this space. This is still very much of a, um, a new function, and so we're just getting going. And so being able to be commercial, see commercial opportunities, and foremost, be able to talk to the business. Mm -hmm. So I think business translation um, figures mightily in the success of a, of a data scientist in that capacity. Maybe not so much in my AI center, mm -hmm. you know, where I've got folks doing, you know, having into deep learning, whatever. I mean, that, there's an element, but the folks that I put, you know, in, in front of the business, those data scientists have to be excellent communicators and have to be passionate in terms of the um, commercialization of opportunities. Linda, thank you so much. Unfortunately, that's all we have time for today, but um, your insights were, uh, were really helpful, I think, in helping us understand how you've scaled um, a really massive and impactful organization at Verizon. So thank you so much. Thanks for the opportunity. Now, just as Linda shared her approach to innovation at Verizon, our final guest today is here to share his perspective from the world of human health. It's increasingly clear that the path to becoming model-driven requires very close collaboration across data science, business, and IT. Our next speaker is a visionary IT leader with 30 years of experience helping companies excel in the digital health space. He has served in top technology and digital transformation roles at Bayer, Monsanto, and Merck. And today, he's the EVP and Enterprise CIO at Johnson & Johnson, leading a global organization accelerating the digital health ecosystem. Rounding out our event today in a fireside chat with Domino's CEO, Nick Elprin, please welcome Jim Swanson. Jim, thank you so much for being here. Every time I talk to you, I learn something new and insightful, and I, I know the audience is going to get a ton out of this. So I want to, um, I want to ask you a couple questions to sort of set the stage for us, and then I'm hoping to get into some details about culture and organization and kind of some of the concrete and practical takeaways these folks can have as they go try to do what you've done. So, so to set the stage, tell us about the mission of Johnson & Johnson and how technology and data science are part of that mission. That, that, thanks, Nick, and thanks for, for uh, inviting me. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, so Jane, Jeff, I start with the mission at the highest level. It's about transforming the trajectory of health for humanity. We have, we have huge goals around transforming healthcare. God knows it needs it. Uh, and there's so many opportunities to do it. And just so, if you don't know j, j we have three big sectors. We have our consumer health business, so think Tylenol, Motrin, oral care like Listerine, um, skin care like Aveeno and Eugenia. We have our pharmaceutical business in a number of therapeutic areas, oncology, inflammation, cardiovascular, infectious diseases. And we have our med tech sector in orthopedics, in vision care, in general surgery. And so a wide range of areas of focus for us. And if we think about how technology and data science plays a role in that, our CEO announced, he just did a Bloomberg article, and he talked about the fact that the next decade 
is going to be more transformative in healthcare than the last 100 years. And he's anchored that on three things. Science, technology, which includes data science, and using our scale for good to transform healthcare, which is really people. So it's integrated into our mission. It's part of our core of how we're going to transform. If, in, if we look at how healthcare is administered today and how much it's advancing, even through this awful pandemic, it has transformed tremendously, but there's so much more opportunity. So we're embedding data science and technology in the core of our business to drive that mission. Fantastic, and, and thanks for all the work that you and your organization are doing. Um, so, so translate that down a level for me. How, well, tell us a little bit about your role and how are data science and technology organized mm -hmm. within the broader organization of, of J&J? Um, and, and, you know, what are some of your reflections on the way that organizational design and structure has, um, has helped or, or hindered progress? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, my responsibilities at J&J, so I'm the enterprise CIO, uh, responsibility for all the technology uh, across the company. I have sector CIOs in each one of those sectors, a head of supply chain, head of pharma, med tech, uh, consumer health. I have a great CTO. So think cloud, infrastructure, a great CISO, et cetera. I also have data scientists in my organization. But we purposely design data science in a hybrid model. And I've done this in a couple of companies that I've been in. And I do really believe it's the best model. Well, you have some core data scientists in the core, like my organization, but you also distribute out data scientists into different parts of the business. And they become what we call bilingual. They're data science experts, but they're also domain experts in the areas of science, if you're in R&D, in the areas of supply chain and logistics, if you're in supply chain, in the areas of finance, if you're in financial, uh, the financial area, or in the domain of, uh, let's say, med tech and understanding procedures. So if we create bilingual data scientists, what that does, it actually empowers the coupling of the data science capability with the domain expertise you need to, to, to solve extraordinary problems. And the way we do the hybrid models, we've actually created a data science center of excellence, or COE. That is actually co-sponsored by myself and one of my other executive um, committee uh, partners, uh, Matai Mammon, who's our head of pharma uh, R&D. Together, we have the responsibility, not in our domain, but across the enterprise. How do we grow data science across Johnson & Johnson? As we bring that council together, it's actually chaired, it's a rotating chair by data scientist leads that run major parts of our data science uh, functions across J&J, &J, and then it's represented by all the data science leads in those areas. And that council has responsibility for three things. One, how do we continue to modernize the technology and data availability for the data scientists to do their work? Second, how do we continue to mature the talent and the capabilities and the maturity of the, of the asset and the science for J&J? &J? And then third, are we working on the right things? Do we have the right portfolio work solving the most difficult problems and we get to learn and build from each other? That council becomes the amplifier and the way we grow and then we embed data scientists in different parts of our business so we can educate our business colleagues on how to leverage it and take maximum advantage of it. That's amazing, and this, the question of sort of hybrid, embedded, federated, I, it's one of the most common questions I hear when I talk to data science leaders. I think everyone's trying to figure that out. It, because you've done it a few different places, is there, um, uh, does your advice on how to do that change on the size of the organization or where they are in their maturation journey, is there a way to start and then a point at which you get to a scale where a COE is necessary? Or you know, what's the right point to to move to the COE model? Yeah, no, it's a great question, it really is. And it, it's less about size of companies, because I've been in $15 billion companies and $50 billion companies, j and is a $100 billion company. We have 144,000 employees, we're in 80, 90 countries around the world, uh, and we sell in probably over 150. Um, I look at the maturity of where the company's at, and so if you're really just starting, you need a kernel. You need a core to start, a central, <laughs> central way to kind of build the capability, build the understanding. And that kernel starts to be that puts the seeds in the ground. And, and part of my background was agriculture, so forgive the metaphors for growing seeds and plants. It's also part, part of you know, the experience I've had. But you need that core, because if you just put one data scientist in finance, or one in HR, or one in R&D, there's not enough critical mass. And they're kind of lost, and there's not a community for them to work in. So you start with that core, but as you start to mature it, you should purposely start to distribute it. Put it in areas where you're seeing success, and I always look for promoters. 
The unfortunate rule of my experience is for every one promoter you have in the organization, there's nine detractors. So if you work with the detractors, you never scale it. You find the promoters that can amplify. And as they amplify, we saw great success in helping us understand uh, molecules and, and a better insight to our pipeline. Wow, I want some of that. How do we do that? And so then you start to build it. And J&J is on that journey as well. We're not done by any stretch, but we've seen areas where we created the core. A lot of data science actually started in my organization, and we started to distribute it out. And my people went to R&D. They went to pharma, or they went to uh, supply chain, and they're, now they're building those out. And so look at where you are in your journey, and then go to that. I'm not a big fan of just complete de decentralization. The reason why is, you don't get the economies of scale to learn from each other. If you're a data scientist, you want to talk to other data scientists. You want to learn in a fully decentralized model, they don't have a community. I think community matters, whether it's a COE or a hardline you know, structure, whatever works with your company, but I think the maturity is the most important thing you should ask. And then how do I grow it from centralization to hybrid embedded, and then with there, you're going to continue to amplify and grow. That's great. Um, I, I want to come back in a minute to some more about sort of culture and organization, but, but first to just make a little more concrete for, for the group some of um, the mission you talked about. Tell us about a couple of the projects or work that J&J has done with data science that you're most proud of or that have had some of the most, um, most exciting impacts on, on global health. Yeah, how long do we have? <laughs> um, I, there's so many across so many spectrums, and I'll just give you a few, few examples. Let's say consumer health. We have a skincare 360 application that takes AI, you can take a picture of your face and immediately it recognizes the face complexion and it can tie it to one of our skincare brands that best suits your particular skin complexion. If that's what we did with that app, that would be kind of cool, but that's not enough. We can actually take that data as we look at skin complexions around the world. Do we have the right formulation of that product that best supports that consumer? And with that formulation data, we can then take that in supply chain and say, I can get the right product at the right time. And I can now take that information, put it in a commercial. How do I make sure I have the right product that I'm marketing to the right consumer in the right place? So one example of just having a really cool AI-enabled app, you can actually embed it in your full data lifecycle. If I think about pharmaceuticals, we're actually using data science to better align potential patients to therapies in our clinical trials all around the world. And so that allows us to get innovative medicines to patients that need it in a much faster way, better aligning patient enrollment to those clinical trials. If I think about med tech, we're doing a ton with augmented reality, and we're tying augmented reality with image and image analytics and data science to help better train a physician. We've actually have data where we can train a physician in an orthopedic procedure 87% times faster with the coupling of augmented reality and data science based on the, how they learn. And then if I think about other interesting areas like cyber, looking at early detection of threats. And one other cool thing we just did recently, I just did it for all of my 5,000 employees in, in my organization. We used inference engines and AI to map skills to people's competencies. I have a heat map now of 5,000 employees against 40 skills that we inferred through AI around where they are in those skills and maturity. And why that's so valuable, I can now create learning journeys, career plans, which we are doing, what we call marketplace gigs to take my really good experts in, in whether it be in um, AI, whether it be software engineering, whether it be data engineering, and map those skills and train it. We did 19,000 hours of training in one month tied to a skills inference AI model, and we're constantly updating it. And so we're changing not only how we think about talent, which is the most important thing, I'm actually taking it across J&J now. We're kind of the canary in the coal mine. If I can do it in JJT, which is the technology origin, I can do it in farm, I can do consumer health, I can do it in, in HR, and I partnered with my HR colleague, the CHRO for J&J, and we're doing it together. So tremendous impact, and I can go on and on of all the examples, but I'll just stop there. Uh, but really excited around how it's getting penetrating, but it's turned to real value. Well, I love that, um, that those examples span across both kind of obviously um, you know, therapies and treatments to improve patient health and outcomes, but also your own internal operational efficiency. And you, know, you talked about supply chain and commercial and even HR. I think it's just a, it's an incredible example of, sort of weaving data science into the whole fabric of the business. Um, I, I want to pick up on the, the way you closed off your last answer. You talked about creating business value, and that's, that's something I've heard you speak about before. Um, that's something we've been talking a lot about over the last couple days here. What, what are some practical pieces of advice and tips and methods you've found for 
um, creating connection between data science and business impact and business value? Yeah, I mean, it, it's one of the most important things that it's not that difficult. First, I'll start with our IT strategy. Our IT strategy has three pillars. One, accelerating business outcomes, or otherwise, why are we here? Second is modernizing our tech ecosystem so we have modern technology to enable all the great science and all the great capabilities like data science for the company. Third is building the digital acumen of 144,000 employees. Because when they understand how they can, when they're more comfortable around technology, digital, they're more inclined to use it and reimagine their business. But on the business outcomes question, why I think it's actually simple is I tie my outcomes to what my business colleagues care about. If they care about net promoter score of their brands in the consumer space, well, I tie my data science or capabilities to that. If they care about net present value of the pipeline, are we using technology, digital data science to elevate the NPV of that pipeline? Because we're taking AI and we're actually looking at better molecules as a result of simulation that could accelerate our ability to create innovative medicines to the marketplace. If I'm in supply chain and they are caring about cost of goods and they want to make sure on time, first time for every product, I tie to that. Because it's their things they care about and now I couple technology, data, data science to enable that. And when they see extraordinary impact to the measures they care about, we get a huge uptake. I, I can't fill enough data scientists to fill the, the appetite now because of they see that correlation. But it also comes to building the digital acumen, making them comfortable. And I loved uh, both Cassie and Cass's, Cass's um, discussion today, and there's so much you, you can apply to what they talked about, but you tie it to those outcomes. And then you also got to understand there's a way of working. You know, I always say the model's never right the first time. It's not the model itself. It could be the data you have. It could be the assumptions you have. How do you build a continual learning company and environment that you're constantly iterating and evolving, but tie it to those outcomes, measure it? You know, we have a goal of uh, half a billion dollars of value in data science. Um, I did a three-year goal and a half a billion dollars in intelligent automation. So a billion dollars, but they're actually starting to, to merge. And we're, we're outpacing that. You know, we're, we're in year two of it, and we're already about six or seven hundred million dollars combined. And so now I'm being asked, well, you soft-pedaled it. You should have gone bigger. <laughs> But it's those type of ways that are really easy to do, and now you're tied to their outcomes, and they need you when you do that. Yeah. Um, so, so I love this idea of aligning data science goals with <laughs> business goals as a way to create that culture of connection to business value and, and, um, and support from the broader organization and probably even motivation for the data science team. When it comes to measurement of data science efficacy or data science maturity, tell me a little more how you think about that. And, and, and the wrinkle or the kind of the rub that I've seen is, um, you know, it, business outcomes can be delayed from data science impact, and they can also be overdetermined. And so, I, I, in theory, ideally, we'd, we'd say, you know, data science is graded on business impact. But, but how do you think about just the, the maturity or the efficacy of data science um, <laughs> when they can't necessarily control everything that gets all the way to business impact? Yeah, so it's really a great question. I actually measure in three ways. I, I have what I call installation measures. Did we install a technology, a model, uh, you know, a data environment? That always gets a small clap from me. My organization always wants to do a big clap. I'm like, well, nobody really cares. We care we install, but nobody else cares. The second measure is adoption. You installed something. Is anybody on the planet using it? If nobody's using it, what good was the installation? So you can measure adoption. You can measure models, how many of those models are being used in, in practice. And the third, third measure is outcomes. So if I see an installation that went well, if I see a high adoption rate, it starts to give me the signals I need, because outcomes take time, to, to Nick's really good point. But we always know what the outcome is, the OKR, the objective, and then the key results. We're really clear on what those are. And I always ask the question, what's the problem to be solved? If we can't answer that question, why do the model? And if nobody cares about the question, <laughs> Why do the model? And so you have those three measures you can actually measure. The second thing as I look at maturity, we actually measure this around how many of our models are reactive, how many are descriptive, how many are predictive, how many are prescriptive, yeah, how many pre predictive how many are prescriptive. So why did it happen? What happened? What's going to happen? What, what do I want to happen? And we measure that so we can actually look at the maturity of those models over time. But the way I challenge this with my business colleagues is I ask them to ask two questions. Somebody presents a, uh, an opportunity in front of them. If they just ask these two things. First question, what data did you use to come up with that recommendation? Because it starts to get to think, I need data. 
to make sure I got a full view of a recommendation. The second question I ask, I ask them to ask, is what model do you use to test your hypothesis? All of a sudden, every executive you have in your company is now your biggest data science advocate. Even though they may know nothing about data science, they're going to create a cascade in the whole organization. I better know before I go talk to the CEO what data I used, and I better have talked to the data science team around what model should I apply to test my hypothesis is accurate. You start to change the model, the mindset. And then you also look at, we, we just did a maturity analysis when the data science council, we looked at a whole bunch of different factors. We looked at, is the technology there to support you? Do you have access to the data that you need? Do you understand the um, privacy regulations around, <laughs> around using it? Um, do you have the right talent? Are we actually attracting and retaining the kind of talent that we need, or are we losing them? You know, I probably can't pay uh, what Cassie's paying at Google, but I can, out, I can outcompete on mission. I can outcompete on mission. So I go for that. And then I tie that with, I got great data that's trying to solve really, really big problems. Are you interested in that? And you're going to learn. I can do that. What actually came out of our last study was change management. That was the lowest score around how do we create change management across the enterprise to make it not a fear factor, but something that the company's going to embrace. So we start working on that. So we look at all these different factors together, and we look at maturity. It's broad. And I use my data science counsel with my co-executive sponsor to ask them, you guys are the experts. What do we need to do to mature, to enable? What are you looking for? And how do we attract, retain, and develop? And all of a sudden, they own it. They're part of the solution. It's not being done to them. It's not being done with them so we can educate 144,000 employees the power of this amazing capability. Right. So one, one follow-up on this idea of um, you know, measuring data science maturity. Is there a, is there a metric you use? Like it ha <laughs> to, to boil something down and obviously oversimplify, yep. what, should, what should people be measuring? In a very simple way, it's how many of your business decisions are informed by, business, by, by models. Ask yourself that question. We make business decisions every single day. I do it in technology, my uh, counterparts in the, the worldwide chairs, in pharma, med tech, in consumer health, the finance, our CFO, our CEO makes a decision every single day, hundreds of them. How many of them are formed by models? All of a sudden, there again, you started to change the mindset immediately. I, and even though it takes a journey, even though it takes time and iterations, those simple questions could change your culture. It can embrace it, especially when you show that we're learning. You create something that we built into our digital acumen uh, uh, agenda in my strategy. It's how do you inform people about ways of working? There's the technical skills they need to know. There's what I call the soft skills, ways of working, agile, um, you know, continual learning. And then there's the leadership skills we're trying to educate. As a leader of these teams, what should you expect? You know, we're a triple A, everything's got to be right the first time. That's not the real world we're in. There's too much uncertainty. How do leaders show up to encourage this learning mindset, continual evolution, continual product teams, diverse teams that come together? Here's the other trick to this. I don't care how smart you are as a data scientist. You cannot solve it on your own. You need a diverse team around you. You need a diverse team of business leaders. And we created high-performing teams. We've got a data scientist, a UX a user experience designer, a, a business owner, a product owner, a software developer, a uh, finance person, a commercially, whatever you need to solve that problem. It's that diverse team that's high-performing that makes the difference because you're learning together, you're evolving together, and the outcome, you all have the same one. The same OKR that everybody shares, that everybody wins or loses on that, that changes the dynamic in the game around the impact you can have individually, team-wise, together, and for the benefit of your company. It's game-changing. That's great. So it's a good segue to, um, I think, one more question I want to ask you, and then we'll take some questions from the audience. <laughs> when you were talking about culture, one of the things that occurred to me is, um, you, you know, J&J is historically a very science-driven organization, so you've been doing research in a sense for a long time, and data science is just another kind of research in some ways. What are some of the, um, the organizational lessons learned or the elements of the organizational DNA from that science background that have informed or maybe given you an advantage uh, or, or driven aspects of your data science culture or, um, or data science processes? Or so? If you, what are your reflections on kind of science versus yeah. data science in the historical context? Uh, it's, it's a great context. First, I start with what I call the power of and. And so we have this uh, framework when we talk about um, 
we're anchored first in our credo. <laughs> Let me start there. Our credo drives every decision. It starts with patients and healthcare professionals that we serve. That's our number one priority. If we're not supporting them every single day, every decision starts with them. And then we have our employees. How are we taking care of our employees? How are we developing <laughs> our employees and making sure they have a safe and, and a great place to work? Our third is our communities. We serve the communities that we're in. If we do those three things really well, then shareholders get a fair return. That really drives our framework or decision. Second, I introduce what I call the AND strategy. So we have in the core of how we think about science, what we call heart, you know, it's a lot of passion what we do, ingenuity, bringing innovation to the table, and people, we can't do anything about people. And I added to it, digital. And digital includes technology, includes data science, includes data. And so don't make it something on the side, incorporate it into the core ethos of your company. And that was kind of the underpinning the end strategy. Now to get to the R&D side of it, what's always cool, and I've been in um, science and IP-based companies my whole life, and I love it. I have a science uh, degree and a computer science uh, graduate degree, and I love putting those things together. This convergence of science and technology, just I get a lot of passion about it. What's cool about being in a science-based company or an IP-based company, if you don't continually innovate, you don't exist. It, it, that's just a brutal fact. You've got to refresh your pipeline in pharma every 10 to 15 years. Uh, you always have competitors in med tech thinking about new technologies they're introducing in the OR or other procedures in consumer health. A lot of that's science-based. You've got to continually innovate. So there is an energy around innovative IP based companies that, are, that exist. And so that creates a culture in those companies of constantly testing and learning and evolving and challenging the status quo, which is a great place to be. But we're also a big company, so we can fall into traps just as easily as anybody. You know, you get complacent. You know, well, we're doing really good right now, and we don't need to continue to innovate. No, we've got to remind ourselves to continually innovate. So that creates a, a unique culture that you can build on, and you can interact, you can test, you can learn. I'm always testing with technology and, and different approaches to data and data science and models. And there's, it's a great incubator for that, but if you never scale it, you never get the maturity of it. So you've got to also think about just great experiments it's tied to an hypothesis, which is very science driven. It's tied to testing and learning, but you got to get it in production. You got to get it to scale. You got to get it to be leveraged. Uh, otherwise, you haven't been successful. So it's kind of that culture in whether it be agriculture or pharmaceuticals and multiple companies I've been in, and I've lived all around the world, where that, that exists across all those. So I hope you can build that in your companies because it's really exciting when you have it. Fabulous. Jim, thanks so much. It's always inspiring to hear both what you're doing inside the organization and also the impact it's having outside the organization. And thanks, Nick. Uh, Domino is a core asset for us. And it's, it's part of that tech ecosystem for data scientists that they love. So thanks for building that product. Continue to build it. You're a great partner. Appreciate okay, it. Thank you. Now, one thing I've learned from our speakers today is that while every organization faces its own unique challenges and obstacles to scaling innovation, one thing is clear. This work is vital. Data scientists, researchers, IT teams, business leaders, we can all drive incredible transformation in our organizations and industries. We heard from Jim and Linda on how their investments in data science and building a model-driven approach are paying off in huge ways. Nick Elprin said that playtime is over for data science. It's now a critical organization capability if you want to win. Nick also shared some exciting new dominant innovations and key capabilities with partners like NVIDIA and Snowflake that make challenging data science work so much easier and more scalable. So two things I leave you with today. Number one, if you're a customer of Domino, I encourage you to get in touch with your Domino team to learn how to put these advancements to work in your organization. And number two, for anyone interested in taking today's learnings one step further, we're hosting a virtual MLOps hands-on workshop next week. We'll go deep on MLOps best practices through interactive labs at each stage of the data science lifecycle. I invite you to join us for this workshop or at any number of our upcoming events, just check out dominodatalab.com slash events. With that, I'm so glad you could join us today for a special event on the recipe for breakthrough innovations. Thank you again, and we hope to see you again soon.